Denizens of the Afterscape, bow down before me, the great Wolfunculus, immortal minister of thought and president of everything. Is there any fool brave enough to utter a whisper of protest against my total control of our heartless and mechanized utopia? Mm, no, actually, things are pretty good. We don't feel repressed. Well... What about the vicious and destructive brain games of danger in which citizens are forced to battle among themselves over knowledge for a greater ration of our meager resources? Do you mean Jeopardy? I guess so. I I guess that's the popular name for it. We really like Jeopardy. And yet you are forced to eat a corporate food substitute of nougat topped with Caramel and peanuts and and robed in in milk chocolate, which I use to consolidate my control over your bodies and minds. Do you mean Snickers? Yes, I I think so. Uh, That might be the commercial name for it. We love Snickers. What if I told you it's people? Is it? No, I'm just saying what if. Uh, look, Look, never mind. What about... Let's see. What about... Come on, there must be something you hate about my apocalyptic brutality. Something that makes you yearn for the before times. Not really. Except maybe it gets cold in here on the third floor because the thermostat is designed for the sixth floor. And then in the summer, the opposite thing happens. Is there any way you could... No, absolutely not. Because this is the afterscape and I am the great Wolfunculus, immortal minister of thought and president of everything, including what temperature it is. It's not a big deal. Well, could you pretend that it is? Because it's very uncomfortable standing here in all these animal skins with this uh, actual wolf head on my head and this icky stick with a human skull on it. And I'd, I'd like to believe that it all means something. Is that too much to ask? For my own personal sanity? Never mind. Just listen to this radio show because I command it. And now he keeps getting Furiosa and Omarosa mixed up. Colin McEnroe. Right. One of them's in the Mad Max thing, and the other one actually is in the White House right now, but I have no idea. And it's not really important which one is which at this point. Uh, Before we begin, I I do want to (laughs) say that I I wish... uh, I wish my old friend Fred File was still alive. He was a wonderful uh, professor and author. Uh, he was based at Trinity College, wrote a book called Goodman 2020, which was, in fact, about a dystopian world. But I would call Fred up sometimes when, particularly there was a tendency in the n- 90s, and I think it's probably still going, that news organizations would see something and they would say it was like some kind of fictional dystopia. For example, in 1992, they looked at the L.A. riots and they said it was like Blade Runner, which it really wasn't. It wasn't anything like Blade Runner, but it was like that that was just something that they picked somehow. And then about a year later, Somalia was completely devolving, and they all said it was like Mad Max or The Road Warrior. And I would ask Fred about that. <laughs> like, that's so weird, right? And Fred would say, first of all, he'd quote Ezra Pound, artists are the antennae of the race, uh, that in many respects, artists do see what is coming. And you know, they do anticipate what's coming. Uh, people don't always pay attention to them. Uh, but one thing I think you're, you're going to see in this show today is the remarkable capacity that visionary writers and thinkers and imaginers have for seeing things that are really coming and maybe sort of with us now. But I do have a caution. Am I getting glib about that? Because, you know, when all those uh, journalists were saying that Somalia was like Mad Max. Well, that's kind of trivializing Somalia. And it's also getting us out of the whole question of whether we caused any of that. As, as James Hanley said at the time, it's kind of the final insult, having you know, exploited this area, engaged in all kinds of Cold War uh, proxy games there to say, wow, it's kind of like a Mad Max movie now. So we're going to try to avoid that kind of glibness. But months and months ago, before Donald Trump was president, one of our guests in the studio right now, Julia Pastel, who is a uh, host of the Literary Disco podcast, in addition to many other things, said that we should do a show about what presumably future, presumably fictive dystopia we're actually living in right now, or what comes closest to it. And we've been thinking about that for a long time. And of course, the pieces on the board moved around a little bit while we were thinking. So it got even more interesting, but maybe more complicated. So Julia's with us. She's also a founding member of CT Improv, as most of you probably know. Brian Slattery is with us, too, arts editor of the New Haven Independent and a producer at WNHH Radio. His new book, Book Burners, comes out next week. It's kind of counterproductive to have a book named Book Burners, though, right? 
That's why we did it online first. Yeah, that's right. Because yeah. you couldn't burn it there. That's right. Um, that's right. Safe. So, um, and we'll, we'll have some other guests as we go along here. But the question is, you know, which dystopia is it anyway? I guess maybe one thing that we need to do, and Brian, I'm going to have um, you start off because you, you've kind of done a little taxonomy for us. But do, <laughs> do, before we even do the taxonomy, do we have a – I'll ask both of you this question, actually. I'll start with you, Julia, since you sure. got us started down this road. Do you have a working – definition for dystopia like for example is Cormac McCarthy's the road a dystopia or is there not enough opia there uh, <laughs> you know to even work with yeah I mean I, I it's a really interesting question because dystopia and science fiction really have bled together in our culture and what I basically use to think about it is you know a writer who's really trying to predict a future based on our current reality um, and often like as you say an antenna or a warning and <laughs> in my definition I also eliminated like aliens or uh, really time travel uh, and all that good stuff just for me a dystopia is a novel that plays out the current conditions of our culture um, and that's a really really broad definition um, and I think you'll see that as we talk about all of our the things that are coming up. So one of the things that you did offer us, Brian, was this kind of taxonomy. You feel like there's at least a, a way to create at least one dichotomy here anyway. Give us, give us yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I was thinking about how I would make sense of the show's premise, <laughs> the, way that I, the way that I sort of carved up the, dyst the dystopian world was to sort of say that yeah, there, there are sort of two broad types. There's there's ones that you'd call something like an order dystopia, where the problem is like there's too much there's too much government control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's sort of author authoritarian things like 1984 or uh, Handmaid's Tale. And on the other side is the dystopias where everything is just kind of falling apart. Yeah, there's sort of like chaotic dystopias, you know, um, which I, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get to her because I insist, but like Octavia Butler is one of them, where she's really good at describing things sort of like falling apart and what... You're supposed to do about that. Well, it's not the problem isn't government overreach. The problem is that there isn't enough of it. There isn't enough order. There isn't enough control. I do think, Julia, that if we look at those um, those falling apart scenarios, mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of classification work or or creation of continuum that you can do there, because obviously, well, like the road is the far extreme of this. It's sure. not like they could tweak that scenario a little bit and things would maybe start to come back together yeah. a little bit. You know, I mean, right. and that's true yeah. of a lot of them. And then, but I mean, Brian pointed us at Children of Men. Which is also pretty bad. It looks like the human race is probably going to go extinct. Mm -hmm. But there's a little bit more recognizable, like there's one government left and stuff. Yeah. And I think, it, you know, what's really important, and I think all dystopian novels hit this in some way, but another big distinction is, is the problem the government or is the problem ordinary man? Is the problem somewhere mm. deep in the culture, in the population? And that is, that is, I think, where it gets really relevant to today is we have to ask ourselves, you know, as we kind of reflect on each of these books uh, or movies, as the case may be, you know, are we pointing at a government that we're unhappy with? Are we pointing at human behavior that we're unhappy with? That That's what makes it really cool and interesting. And I think what makes it... Um, a fact that none of these is completely right, except maybe, of course, Octavia Butler, who is a genius. <laughs> All right. We're going to keep circling back to Octavia Butler. Uh, I'm prepared to join in with that, too. Just to help you refresh your memory, so Children of Men is based on a novel by P.D. James. The director, is his name Alfonso Cuaron? Yeah. yeah. Uh, directed this. Uh, it has Clive Butler and, and Julianne Moore. It does look like the, the human race for whatever reason, can no longer reproduce. And most of the governments have fallen apart. And you get the feeling that there's been some kind of ecological, biological catastrophe, although I think it's not entirely clear what it is. It's, we'll hear just a little bit from that movie. Day 1000 of the Siege of Seattle. The Muslim community demands an end to the army's occupation of mosques. The Homeland Security Bill is ratified. After eight years, British borders will remain closed. The deportation of illegal immigrants will continue. Good morning. Our lead story. The world was stunned today by the death of Diego Ricardo, the youngest person on the planet. Baby Diego was stabbed outside a bar in Buenos Aires after refusing to sign an autograph. Witnesses at the scene say that Diego spat in the face of a fan who asked for an autograph. He was killed in the ensuing brawl. The fan was later beaten to death by the angry crowd. 
Born in 2009, the son of Marcelo and Silvio Ricardo, a working class couple from Mendoza, he struggled all his life with the celebrity status thrust upon him as the world's youngest person. Diego Ricardo, the youngest person on the planet, was 18 years, 4 months, 20 days, 16 hours, and 8 minutes old. So, armies occupying mosques, deportation of illegal immigrants. Julia, I don't really recognize anything there. So and I'm just gonna... generalized sobbing in the background. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that really rings true. <laughs> I think one of the things, Brian, that is, and l- actually, let's talk about Oct- Octavia Butler for just a second because you got me interested <laughs> in, in her uh, parables, uh, novels. And so, it, her these the novels. Uh, I've just started reading the parable of the sower. Yeah. Uh, and then the next one is the parable of the, the, the talents. Of the talents. Okay. Yeah. There's sort of an interesting combination of the t- two genres we're talking about in a way. In yes. the sense that there has been some kind of horrible ecological catastrophe that sounds an awful lot like global warming. The first book was written in 1993. Once again, artists are the antennae of the race. An awful lot of these writers were writing speculative fiction about global warming and climate-related catastrophes before the political community really engaged with this question. So there's been a horrible catastrophe. There's been a real breakdown of civilization, but not a total breakdown of civilization. Right. And, and as a result, there are these presidencies, you know, that can still occur and have quite an impact on the way people live. Yeah, right. I mean, the the thing that's so compelling about Octavia Butler's scenario is that she doesn't it's not like it's not Mad Max. It's not it's not the Road Warrior. It's this kind of like it's it's more like sort of like you're you're you know, the, the government is there, but it's just sort of ineffectual. And if, if you know, if, if and on a local level, if people um, want to assert their authority over other people locally, they can. So that there's this there's a sense of the United States is more like, you know, this 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 kind of very, very loose federation of, you know, quasi lawless places where if people want some semblance of order, they have to make it for themselves. And, you know, that is that that is one of the, you know, coolest concepts that's driving both of those books, is how people create those orders and who is who is included in the order and who is left out of it, you know. Yeah, and I think, you know, it has to be said. I had not, um, I'm, I like Octavia Butler a lot, um, but I hadn't read these uh, books until very recently, and I was, I was kind of asking around about the show, which is, it kept coming up um, mostly because of a character named Jarrett who's elected right. president. I actually <laughs> brought that. it with me. I'm going to read it to you. I'm just not going to draw any direct comparisons. You can just listen. Uh, now we have another group that uses crosses and slaughters people. Jarrett's people could could be behind it. Jarrett is, insists on being a throwback to some earlier, simpler time. Now does not suit him. Religious tolerance does not suit him. The current state of the country does not suit him. He wants to take us all back to some magical time when everyone believed in the same God, et cetera, et cetera. It literally says, Jarrett wants us to make America great again. Uh, and then skipping a bit. This book, once again, written in the 1990s. Yes, exactly. And then uh, there's uh, a lot of violence in the society. And then it says, Jarrett condemns the burnings, but does so in such mild language that his people are free to hear what they want to hear. It is so eer- eerily precious. Oh, yeah. oh, my God. It is, it's mind blowing. <laughs> I mean, it's a book that you're reading in the voice of a 15 year old girl. And you have to put it aside because of how shockingly right on it is. And so, by the way, now we really got your attention here. So this is Octavia Butler. There's really two books, Parable of the Sower and then Parable of Talents. Start with Parable of the Sower. All right. So I would say, you know, so Brian set up that really nice dichotomy for uh, for us. There there are dystopias of, of control and then dystopias of chaos. I would argue that you could maybe say there's a third category, which are dystopias of stupid. You know, <laughs> yes, yeah. you know, that there's there's this kind of sense that for whatever reason, you know, we stopped that a lot of atrophy, a lot of mental atrophy happens. And mm-hmm. so the, maybe the high browed version of this is a, a less well known novel by Walter Tevis called Mockingbird. But it's very similar to a lot of books like it in Mockingbird. Basically, the entire human race race has doesn't know how to read anymore because nobody's needed to read for a really long time. So people didn't do it. Uh, and now things are breaking, and nobody knows how to read anything to get any information. 
uh, about how to fix these machines that used to do all the work that involved that, that allowed people to to let go of things like reading. So it, it's and, and I think you can even argue that Brave New World, one of the classics, although it's very much a novel of control, um, mm-hmm. is also about getting stupid. Yeah, right? or, like, or the, the movie Wally. <laughs> or the movie Wally. Yeah. Or, and, and there's one other movie that came up again quite frequently in the campaign, so much so in 2016 that the makers of this movie were th- sought out repeatedly by political journalists to talk about the application or the relevance of the movie that they had made about the far distant future. I believe it takes, 500, it takes place 500 years in the future. It's created by Mike Judge, whose contributions to society also include Beavis and Butthead. And it's called Idiocracy. Let's hear a little bit of it. For the last time, I'm pretty sure what's killing the crops is this Brondo stuff. The Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. So wait a minute. What you're saying is that you want us to put water on the crops? Yes. Water. Like out the toilet? Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be out of the toilet, but but yeah, that's the idea. But Brondo's got what plants crave. It's got electrolytes. Okay, look, the plants aren't growing, so I'm pretty sure that the Brondo's not working. Now, I'm no botanist, but I do know that if you put water on plants, they grow. Well, I've never seen no plants grow out of no toilet. Hey, that's good. You sure you ain't the smartest guy in the world? Yeah, so let's <laughs> Okay, look, y- you want to solve this problem. I want to get my pardon, so why don't we just try it, okay? And not worry about what plants crave. Brondo's got what plants crave. Yeah, it's got electrolytes. What are electrolytes? Do you even know? It's what they use to make Brondo. Yeah, but why do they use them to make Brondo? Because Brondo's got electrolytes. (laughs) All right, so... Oh, my God. By the way, a a plot is to our producer, Jonathan McNichol, who who had to locate a section of that movie that does not contain the S word like every other word. You know, it really was not an easy thing to do. And so, and that movie has kind of a complicated politics to it because it really, when you actually look at the underlying plot theme, there's something kind of offensively eugenics oriented about it. Classist but, a little and bit. And classist, <laughs> and yeah, it's pretty, pretty horrible. <laughs> but I mean, Brian, that idea, anyway, that, that that's another dystopia, right? Everybody sure. just agrees to stop thinking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's there, but I think that it's... I mean, I, I, we don't need to, like, argue about the taxonomy <laughs> all that much, right? <laughs> but it is, I mean, there, there, there's definitely, uh, I, uh, okay, the reason that I'm sort of resisting uh, going too far in this direction is because I sort of dislike it when, when you know, a, a theory assumes that people are stupid, you know, which I don't think they are, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it does get at a certain amount of, you know, how you get your information and how much you trust the information you get, which is a huge part of what's going on right now and a huge part of a lot of dystopian fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that, you know, a big theme in the dystopias that I have listed here, Fahrenheit 451 is probably one a lot of people have heard, Hunger Games, Brave New World, Infinite Jest, and so many more um, is entertainment. The question is, are we entertaining ourselves to a degree that we don't care about anything outside of our own minute-to-minute experience. Um, and it's funny. that That is really hard, and it's hard to confront because, you know, there's this question like, how much are you just being a Luddite? I mean, there's things <laughs> – like, for example, <laughs> in Fahrenheit 451, there is this – in the novel, absolutely abhorrent concept that you would like have people over to your house and all like watch TV together and participate in the like basically do a play reading along with the TV. And that is something that people would find super cool <laughs> mm. in this time and is treated with absolute disgust. I mean, obviously, the advent of television was a shocking uh, thing to a lot of these writers. Um, But then there's other, I think, more complicated criticisms of entertainment. Um, For example, in Infinite Jest, uh, the core uh, concept is that there's this video called The Entertainment, which is so good. It's also called Infinite Jest. Uh, It's so good that when you see it, you lose the will to do anything else except watch it. And then that is a weapon of mass destruction. It's a terrorist weapon because it causes people to totally disengage from their cultures and their families and their societies. And I do think there is something that is a great um, warning light 
uh, to us. It's like, are we entertaining ourselves so much that we don't care anymore um, about anything? Well, I mean, at that level, this is something, Brian, that these writers have been able to anticipate very well. I mean, Octavia Butler has already sort of seized the virtual reality stuff that's going to come, as a lot of writers did way before this became mm. accessible, although there were a lot of prototypes of those things kicking around then. But even even Huxley at Brave New World, it's really weird because this weekend I heard for the first time, I didn't, I guess I heard it on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, which isn't really the most authoritative news source, but there are these, there is like a new feature to certain smartphones where you can kiss somebody else. There's like a rubber pad that you kiss on and then the person <laughs> who's you know, like a continent away has a Are rubber pad. And no, I'm not. Uh, is there any, did anybody else hear this? <laughs> I'm not making it. I'm not hallucinating. And there's that, that person. There, and then you start get there. The whole thing is all texturized so that you can experience kissing each other, although you're you know, and that's like the feelies in in Brave New World. I mean, like a lot of oh, this. Yeah, for sure. A, a lot right. of this stuff really just turns out to come true. Yeah, and there's also, I mean, there's also the like the the thing that a lot of the like the controlled dystopia stuff has going in it is is the idea that people will accept their information if the, if they like the production values that accompany it, mm-hmm. which is you know, which is this really sort of important thing because I think that um, especially now that the now that the media which I guess includes us. I hate saying the media as if it's this en- entity out there when, <laughs> especially the here we are now. on the radio. <laughs> but, but there, there is, there is something to be said for it. Like there, it, it's weird, for example, that, that people really do like their news to have theme music, you mm. know, accompanying it. Yeah. There's, there's gotta be these, these kind of like Hollywood style things, you know, as we report from, you know, the war in Africa or your human interest story. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's reasonable to ask like why we want that and why yeah, we need it. You certainly, know? Uh, coverage of both Gulf Wars, both Iraq invasions, oh, were accompanied by these packages uh, totally. of this very highly specialized militaristic, but also kind of NFL type music. And now even right. the, the political debates are often packaged with uh, NFL style, uh, you know, let's get excited uh, kind of music. We're going to take a little break here. I think we do have to have at least one steel cage match here. Mm. You know, Julia and I, uh, next month probably, will be participating in this whole tournament of books where, like, books have to battle with mm-hmm. one another. But I think we I think we have to have Brave New World in 1984, mm-hmm. a title we haven't even said yet. <laughs> they are sort of the er titles in some ways. Yeah, we'll we have, have to, to yeah, go yeah. point by point. We've got to put them on a line and let them, <laughs> let them battle it out a little bit and, and then maybe make some room for also some arguments for Hunger Games or anything else. Mm-hmm. Any, I mean, we have, we, we got to pick some of these somehow, you know. So anyway, we'll take a break and we'll get even more definitive when we come back. Ain't no other source of sunlight Two-ton mic, leave you tongue-tied Running them up with technology with no apology Shout it out to my colony with third art physiology Millennium past apocalypse is all I spit Make you swallow in your weak style I'll abolish it with nuclear rockets They glue to your optics with sci-fi Unsettling, man in metal blends Underground, chilling with the mole man And his whole fam Inhibit bacteria growth All right. Uh, we're talking about uh, which dystopia is it that we're living in uh, with Brian Slattery and Julia Pistel. Before we swing into this next part of the conversation, I would like to point out another thing that might have happened is we've just given up on some of these things. Like people are now willingly consuming a product called Soylent. So <laughs> think about that. All right. Because that was supposed to That's be like shocking. In, in, in humanity's defense. It's only a few people, really. Only a few people, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Still, uh, unironically consuming is yeah, is my like, surprise. I, I keep wondering if they know like where that name came from. I I think it's amazing that the company named it that. I yeah. do too, I, I and I thought it was a joke, thing. and right. then I saw an ad or something, and it was like, nope, this is just it's very sincere. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we have to talk a little bit about 1984. 1984 is kind of back in the news. Sales of, of 1984 apparently shot up when the hot <laughs> hashtag alternate facts. Uh, came out <laughs> over the weekend. 1984 is George Orwell's 1949 masterpiece is more than anything about the control of information, about the ability to say something that st- is true, even if uh, reality would seem to suggest that it's not. The battle to be won is the battle over history and the battle over reality. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very much that kind of battle. Let's hear an especially chilling clip from 1984. They said Donald Trump did not draw well. I said uh, it was almost raining. The rain should have scared him away, but God looked down and he said, we're not going to let it rain on your speech. In fact, I f- when I first started, I said, oh, no. First line, I hit, got hit by a couple of drops. And I said, oh, this is, 
this is too bad, but we'll go right through it. But the truth is that it stopped immediately. It was amazing. And then it became really sunny. Then I walked off and it poured right after I left. It poured. All right, that's not really from 1984. That's Donald Trump saying that it didn't rain during his speech, that the sun came out. That's not true. It rained all the way through his speech. Uh, <laughs> the sun did not come out. Uh, but it really is kind of the kind of, I mean, Julia, I think all, a lot of us wind up thinking about the Neil Postman books. Is it Amusing Ourselves to Death? Is that what it's called? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, and so he compares Orwell and, and Huxley. H- Huxley in 31 wrote Brave New World. Orwell in 49 wrote 1984. Uh, Christopher Hitchens has also done some interesting comparisons of the two. You know, 1984 is the more rigid one, right? It's yeah. like, if I can control everything that you say and think, by force, basically, yeah. more than by craft, I win. Yeah, I mean, I think, so, <laughs> I guess I find myself very disappointed to feel the 1984 forces. Uh, I mean, of course, who wouldn't? But it just seems so simplistic in a way. Um, but I was rereading it before the show, and it's there are certain elements of 1984 that are just undeniably right on. So surveillance, perpetual surveillance, perpetual war, um, and, of course, um, I think this is, a cliche by now, but two minutes of hate. So every day we all just scream at our TV or our computer or whatever for two minutes, and then we go back to our sense of complacency. Um, and so all of those feel feel really, really right. Um, but I think what Brave New Worlds gets right is, uh, of course, Soma, which is a drug that you take to basically zone out. Um, and on a deeper level, Brave New World de- deals really well with race and the idea of the noble savage and, like, propping people up as celebrities um, in a way that 1984 just doesn't really deal with as well. Um, And I think that's a theme throughout a lot of these dystopias. They're mostly written by white men, and so we don't see a lot of the, like, nuance about uh, different races and different classes kind of hashing it out in these dystopias. So I think I would argue for Brave New World being generally more right on uh, in terms of its nuances, but there's shades of 1984. Shades is too subtle. There's like little slaps of 1984 lately that are are undeniable. So I don't know. I don't know anymore. So Brian Slattery, you've got a book coming out with book burning right in the title. (laughs) Um, So I'll read from Postman. He says, uh, what Orwell well feared were uh, those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book for there would be no one who wanted to read one. And Hitchens wrote that Orwell seemed to strain credulity because he posited a regime that would go to any length to own and possess history, to rewrite and construct it, and to inculcate it by means of coercion, whereas Huxley rightly foresaw that any such regime could break because it could not bend. React to that a little bit. I don't know anything about the book that you've got coming out, but you know the title, <laughs> the title suggests that it's on point. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, the thing that I keep thinking about, I mean, I keep, I keep thinking about 1984 mostly because of the Newspeak stuff, you know, the way that, mm-hmm. the way that they, mm-hmm. they sort of ingeniously make the language. And this is, this is a place where it kind of dovetails with Brave New World, right, where it's just like you shape the way people think so that, they, so that they're more compliant. And the thing that I wish right now is that George Orwell was one of the correspondents, you know, for a major paper at those press conferences, because mm-hmm. I feel like he would be so well equipped to see through it quickly and to to ask the questions that are at the very least sort of embarrassing or difficult to answer, <laughs> but also kind of taking the speech on its own terms, which is the some which is something that you know you, you don't see the, the the press corps hasn't quite figured out what to do with <laughs> mm-hmm. with the I I'm trying I'm struggling to find the word because it's not information but mm-hmm. the the stuff that's coming out of the administration right now. I mean, Winston Smith's job in 1984, Julia, is to rewrite news clips, o- old yeah. news clips, right? So that everything will kind of conform. Everything will, um, the, the storyline will, will cohere uh, mm-hmm. perfectly. And, and that, I, I think, you know, even if it's not exactly our pleasant, present reality, it's kind of what people are fighting about a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the question is, I mean, uh, I think one thing that most dystopias don't get exactly right is like the amount that the culture and the media is willing to like contribute in terms of content. I mean, mm. a lot of these dystopias present the culture as, you know, people just constantly receiving information. But where we are now is everybody's just, including myself, vomiting their own take, their own hot take, their own perspective. And of course, every single time we do that, we are 
crafting or recrafting a narrative of what our culture is and where it's going. So, so yeah, I mean, of course, we're all rewriting history every day and we're all arguing over which version is the correct version. That is, we are all Winston now trying to speak truth to some power, but the power isn't Trump or his administration. It is what is history? What is the America that should be great again or was never great? I mean, we're all as a citizenry grappling with that question all the time. But really, if 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 you can lose a battle about whether it was raining or sunny on a particular occasion, <laughs> then really you you really have lost some fundamental, you know, pieces on the chessboard. Yeah, uh, and I mean I think that's um, that's where this gets really surreal and kind of fun to do this show is I didn't even know most of these things were up for debate. You know, <laughs> the idea that any fact is now your opinion. Every piece is an opinion piece, whether or not it's the weather report or something else. I mean, what's, uh, yeah, what, like what's surprising is the idea that the administration would want that to be up for debate. Sure. <laughs> right? This idea of like what the weather was like doesn't yeah. seem like something you'd even like be interested in arguing about. Well, it could be a, you know? a trial balloon, a trial weather balloon. Like, yeah. can, can we get away with I this? I suppose. Yeah. Um, okay, let me make everybody uncomfortable because I think it's important to do that. And Jonathan McNichol uh, has made a really uh, great point as we were getting ready for this, which is that, so uh, I think as good public radio liberals, we tend to look at all this stuff and say, well, that's the authoritarian oppression that comes from autocratic, you know, crypto fascist mm-hmm. governments. You know, that's what a lot of these dystopias are about. Uh, it's, they're also about about uh, how people didn't heed warnings about climate change Mm -hmm. and horrible things happen. And and that's all very true. Uh, But it's possible once in a while to find something that maybe uh, we would be a little less comfortable with. So 1984, one of the famous phrases to come out of it is thought crimes. Um, One of the things that we're pretty comfortable with is the notion of a hate crime, that um, your charges could be intensified. You could face, you know, instead of a high misdemeanor, a low felony, if we know what's in your head. Uh, if we know what you're thinking about or what motivates you. So I don't know, Brian, you're at least nodding over there. Is there anything <laughs> mildly Orwellian about that idea? Oh, I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, I actually, you know, when, with, with all of the sort of, uh, you know, hand-wringing in the journalistic community about whether you're allowed to call what, what Trump is doing lying, mm-hmm. right? That's, it's mm-hmm. the same idea. It's about, it's about presuming that you know what's in his head. Mm-hmm. And I, I am one of those people who don't, I, I think that, like, the word lie is a, very very difficult word to use like unless you have him somewhere on record saying like yes i'm going to lie about this because otherwise you're making an amazing assumption about Mm -hmm. about what's going on inside someone's brain and you're making the amazing assumption that he knows what the truth is for for starters uh, yeah yeah i mean like i I think that that sort of thing is really important and perhaps i'm more comfortable with this because i don't i don't think of myself as entirely liberal but the (laughs) (laughs) but i do think that there's such a thing as overreach into the you know I, I don't like it when people reach into other people's heads and tell them what they're thinking. Mm. You know? Yeah, and it gets at, with Trump in particular, it gets to a really frightening question that I've seen sort of floated as, is he mentally unstable or is this some kind of evil Orwellian, you know, manipulation? And when you guess what someone's intentions are, you're choosing one of those sides, which is, is super interesting. Okay, I want to, before we run out of time, so we've talked, I mean, some of the big players here, I mean, I think we've mentioned them, and certainly, classically, it really is Brave New World against 1984. Um, uh, we've mentioned some of the other players. We haven't said that much about Hunger Games, and, and I confess, <laughs> I've never read the Hunger Games books, uh, and I watch the movies, and I think they're kind of boring. But, um, <laughs> um, but Julia... Zing! <laughs> well, no, I mean, it just, no, I really see that as my own failing, and I'm, I'm just not, I'm not the target demo for the Hunger Games, let's be honest. But I know that people who, like, smart people read these books and get a lot out of them, and and a number of people who sort of contributed to the show, including our producer Josh Nalea, really thought, I I think Hunger Games might be his top choice, and he's got an interesting argument for it. But, but Julia, I feel like I I know somehow that you are a student of the Hunger Games. Yeah, I've read them. I've seen the movies. And, you know, any good dystopian or sci-fi novel, it's really the premise that makes or breaks it. Mm. Um, Every single one of these books is about a a soldier who's a free thinker who breaks through the system. Um, But the Hunger Games' system is really powerful, uh, powerfully right on. So the idea behind the Hunger Games is that there's a ruling class like the 1%. Um, They're not authoritarian. They're just fancy people. 
And they are fed and uh, supplied everything they need by all these other districts. Um, and once a year, uh, there's a gladiator style tournament uh, to kind of enter both simultaneously entertain everybody and also keep everybody in line. Um, and what's great about the Hunger Games that makes it feel so right is the class distinctions. It's saying, look, we're all separated, we're all in our own little pools. And we are being made to fight against each other and believe that other lower classes are the enemy rather than questioning the whole system. Um, And also the idea of (laughs) violence as entertainment is obviously what is so compelling at it about it. I I like the movies okay, but part of the reason they don't work is that they undermine the premise itself because we real people are sitting watching this violence as entertainment. so, you know, I know Josh Josh loves The Hunger Games, and I really like them, too, because the idea is we're all fighting against the wrong thing. We're fighting against each other. We're in our own little pools, but we really should be looking upwards to see how we can dismantle the system from the top. And I will say part of the reason that Hunger Games and Octavia Butler's uh, novels are really interesting is that um, these are the only two on my list that are written by women. As I mentioned before, we really have this idea of dystopian literature as something created by men and mostly white men, which is completely amazing because why wouldn't we believe the stories of the people who are at the bottom, who are already living in some kind of oppressive scenario? Well, there's the, the Handmaid's Tale also, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. 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 And actually, but she's got but also. But you're, you're totally right. There's, yeah. there's a, that's a, there's a real imbalance there for sure. Yeah, and Margaret's also got all those oryx and crake yeah. things and yes, stuff like yeah. that too. So, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely. I mean, that's tomorrow's show. By the way, we're going to do a show about why white people feel, some white people feel that they've been oppressed and disenfranchised and need a champion to lead them back to greatness. Great, I will um, listen. Yeah, I'm sure you will. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, you know, we have to go to a break here pretty soon, Brian. But. You know, as Julia's talking, I was reading the notes, and, and Josh, who isn't the producer of this particular episode, one of our producers, he was citing the Hunger Games because of that kind of divide and conquer uh, mentality. He also compared it to the Morlocks and the Eloy and the Time Machine. Mm-hmm. And I started thinking either, like Julia, I think, just implied that the way that you rea- react to this question, which dystopia are we actually living in, it may depend on how entertaining you find certain dystopias that you've watched or read, <laughs> or it may be kind of a Rorschach blot, blot for how you see. So- I was thinking maybe Josh actually sees society as this particular way, and he wouldn't be wrong if he did. But but maybe one of the ways that one of the reasons we react the way we do has to do with how we read our circumstances, which may be different from person to person. Yeah, no, I think so. I mean, in 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 my particular case, the I mean, with, without going on and on about it, the like my abiding interest in dystopian fiction is like totally hand in hand with my abiding interest in just like public policy and global affairs and all of that sort of thing. And I do find it, I, I don't, I don't think of dystopian fiction as entertaining so much as like helpful. Mm-hmm. You know, I, in fact, I kind of have this litmus test is like the worse it makes me feel, the more value I need to get out of it. Like I don't mind feeling bad as long as there's a payoff at the end. But if I feel bad and there's no payoff, I feel I just feel really bad, and I tend to hate the thing that I just <laughs> watched or read or whatever it was. Oh, we're getting a lot of uh, tweets and things like that on the social medias. Jan Davis wants to know when we're getting to the postman and water world. It is interesting. <laughs> speak, speaking of white men, like the whitest white man in the world is Kevin Costner, you know, and there he is at the helm of two different uh, levels of dystopia with two different dew points, really. Um, one very wet, one very dry. Uh, okay, we have to take a break. We're going to come back and uh, we're going to be uh, joined by someone who is an expert on how to survive each and every one of these fictional dystopias. found out that the O'Reilly Factor is a real Fox News program. Every time it came on, I thought I was just catching the same little part of the Hunger Games. Today's show was produced by Jonathan McPants and me, Kyone Wolf. Also appearing in the intro were Pants, Betsy Kaplan, and Patrick Scahill. Our intern was Winston Fisher. The part of Bill Curry was played by Stanley Tucci. Find all of our episodes at wnpr.org slash Colin. 
And now, back to Colin. Uh, all right. You know, <laughs> as the campaign raged on in, in 2016, well, let me go back to Fred File for two seconds. Fred File, this uh, terrific uh, writer and thinker who died many years ago, but was a friend of mine. And one of the things that he would talk about is end of the world fun for you and me. That, you know, the, the truth is we kind of like brutal apocalyptic scenarios. That's why we, that's why there's so much culture produced that is them. That there's something about it that we like that, like, basically I think you know, there's this notion that all the people that we don't like are going to die and we're going to live through it. And there's this sense that we'll be the people sitting in comfort somewhere while all of this horrible stuff is happening. And, you know, a couple of times during the campaign, particularly Steve Bannon, uh, you know, there were quotes that, from him that would surface about, you know, yeah, maybe we just need to burn it all down, you know, and start all over. There were those, those kinds of quotes. And once again, I think when people say that, they think that they won't be the ones getting burned. Uh, but I don't think that's necessarily the case. And one of the questions is, how do, how do you avoid being one of those people who goes up in the... In the uh, in the conflagration. Uh, so joining us is Dasa Edwards, who uh, writes for a number of outlets, including Jezebel, where she published a piece called A Fictional Guide to Surviving at the End of the World. Uh, before we bring her into the conversation, I want to remind you that here in studio with me are Julia Pistel, host of the Literary Disco podcast and a contributor to Book Riot, Brian Slattery, arts editor for the New Haven Independent, producer at WNHH Radio, author of many books, and he has a new book, Book Burners, coming out next week. Stasa Edwards, one of the things that you point out that's kind of a consistent trope in the world of the, in the worlds that we've been talking about here has been the notion that there are people who are warning everybody else, right? There's always somebody who sees it coming. Uh, we've been talking a lot about Octavia Butler. I mean, the whole point uh, of her character in these parables novels is that she keeps saying, well, no, you should have a plan. There's something going wrong here. So tell us a little bit more about that idea. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think that part of the dystopia in fiction is that it does really ascribe to the idea, um, a kind of biblical idea that the end of the world is coming and that it exists in the institutions that we have already built and surrounded ourselves with and we have already kind of constructed that architecture and that we need to look closely at them. Um, to criticize them and scrutinize them to understand that we are kind of the masters of our own eventual destruction. And you see that play out in many ways, be it uh, a nuclear apocalypse or coercive reproduction or a totalitarian governments that we've already kind of planted the seeds of the end. Well, we certainly, towards the end of the show, would like to give people some very helpful tips on how not to be the people who get sucked underneath. Uh, what have you got for us? Well, I think... Um, there's, you know, if you look at the history, being one of the people that sucked underneath is kind of inevitable. Um, but there are kind of rare fighters that kind of exist at the end of the world. And if you look at kind of recent trends, especially in the literature, you see that uh, the apocalypse in a kind of strange way, that women will be kind of survivors of the apocalypse in part because I think a lot of these writers are positing that women already live so close to that edge that we are perhaps better prepared to survive the end of the world. And of course, teens will be uh, very great and live through uh, the end of the world as well. So get yourself a teen uh, if you can. So as a 62-year-old white man, I'm just fodder, really. I mean, I'll be among the first to go. You're an extra. Yeah. And I mean, Julia, I think (laughs) some of this is because, as we've been alluding to, although not a lot of this fiction has typically been produced by women, more and more is, right? I'm absolutely positive there's a million uh, writers who are women or people of color who haven't broken through to the mainstream. But yeah, I think that, you know, science fiction in general has been thought of as a male genre in a lot of in a lot of ways. So so yeah, of course. I mean, I think what's really interesting that we haven't talked about at all yet, but Stasa just uh, mentioned, is teens. Uh, teenagers have like this endless appetite for dystopias and the idea that they could be the hero um, who thinks for themselves. And I think even though it's uh, there's so much, there's an absolute glut of these books, and a lot of them are terrible. Uh, it is great to be planting the seeds of resistance in <laughs> in our youth. So I think it's a great trend it's really exciting and fun for teens to think i will maintain my independence no matter what well stasa is that also because teens are still in the process of crafting their identities they're not stuck in some hideous dead-end existence the way i am so you know they can actually pick some things that they they could be and do 
Right, exactly. I mean, the teens are already kind of in this liminal space, especially teen girls, you know, perched on the edge of adulthood. But one of the primary things, I think, especially in young adult dystopias, is that it's never, it's teens are the only ones that can truly see that this is a dystopia, where the adults all around them believe that they have constructed this utopia instead. Mm -hmm. And we see that playing out in the Hunger Games, but also the Divergence series, right? That it's only these teenage girls that have the insight that they aren't, um, they haven't been uh, reduced by the system yet and can see individuality as a value and a goal in the system that adults are telling them otherwise is ideal and harmonic. You know, Brian, you know, I wonder too how how um, necessary the notion of survival is to make this kind of genre or fiction sustainable. I mean, in Children, of, Children of Men and Cormac McCarthy's The Road, th those are, I mean, there just aren't any good outcomes. You know, nobody's really going to figure this out, I don't think. You know, maybe Children of Men has a little bit more hope uh, locked in it somewhere. But, I mean, mostly I think we read these things and enjoy these things because we project ourselves into the world of survivors, not the victims. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, you, you can't have a story in which your main character dies quickly, you know, a quick and <laughs> a quick and painful death, and then whatever whatever happens happens, for sure. But I, I also think that like there, it, it depends on the it depends on the dystopia, right? I mean, there are there are people who who survive them through their you know through their wits, and there are people who are on the who survive them because they're you know it's one of those like dystopia for who, right? There's mm. there's mm. a utopia on the other side of it always. Where there's mm -hmm. a group of people who are doing just fine, and they're doing it at the expense of of everybody else, you know, and those people are surviving as well. But mm -hmm. it's it's not the sort of survival that anybody wants to sort of associate with usually. All right, so um, Stasa, we have like just thirty seconds or so left. Do you have like one good solid tip? Like if you see uh, a dystopia or the end of the world or the breakdown of civilization coming, based on everything that you uh, absorb from the genre, what should you do? I think the best answer is probably to befriend a person who has, like, survival skills. Right. <laughs> like a prepper. Or join a dog pack, you know, and just hope the other dogs don't notice that you're not one of them. Um, exactly. All right. Well, listen, this was a topic, topic that took us a long time and a lot of energy to tackle, uh, but we did it thanks to Julia Pistel uh, for suggesting it in the first place and then for coming on said show. She is the host of the Literary a disco podcast, a host of it actually, uh, a contributor to Book Riot and a founding member of CT Improv. Thanks to Stasa Edwards, uh, who uh, writes for Jezebel, where she wrote a fictional guide to surviving the end of the world. And Brian Slattery, uh, author of many books. Thanks to everybody else. We'll be back tomorrow with this disturbing topic of ours. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, but a Twitter. <laughs>